Well, here we are. I am several months late making this video. I always said that this channel is a hobby and I will do it as long as life allows me to. And lately, life has not been allowing me to make videos as often as I would like. But you didn't click on this video to hear me yap about that. You clicked on this video to see if I was going to torch RFK Jr. And you're goddamn right I am. That's because several months ago, RFK Jr. made the decision to pull all U.S. funding from Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. They are a global nonprofit group that solely dedicates itself to delivering vaccines to underserved areas of the world. For many children in the world living in areas with poor healthcare infrastructure, access to vaccines is only granted through organizations like Gavi. But RFK has now decided that the U.S. is not going to help with that mission. RFK Jr. has said that he is going to make his decisions based off the scientific evidence and enforce a gold standard of science in all of his decision making. So what was his decision making process with this? And does it check out? Is it supported by science and the available data? He thinks it is, but let's see if that's really true. In his video announcing this pulling of funding from Gavi, RFK cited specific research that he thinks justifies this decision. He focused specifically on science surrounding the DTP vaccine, which is the vaccine that protects against diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. These three diseases are caused by three different kinds of bacteria. Today in the U.S., vaccination rates are high enough that we don't really have to worry about these three diseases. Doctors hardly even see them. They're so rare, thanks to vaccines. But before vaccines were as widespread as they are today, pertussis alone caused about 20,000 cases of blindness, deafness, or heart defects every single year. Pertussis is also particularly dangerous to the developing fetus and can cause significant congenital birth defects if the mother is not vaccinated. Before diphtheria vaccines were widespread in the U.S., it would cause about 200 cases per 100,000 people per year and cause about 20 deaths per 100,000 people every single year. And diphtheria is a nasty disease. Even having a case of it is horrific. The bacteria produces a toxin that can stop your cells from making protein, and it kills them very fast. So when diphtheria gets into the throat of an infected person and starts killing off the cells in the lining of your throat, those dead tissue can slough off and literally choke an infant. Adults more often survive this illness because our windpipes are bigger and don't get clogged by the dead tissue that the bacteria creates, but an infant's windpipe is not as big, and it can choke on its own dead tissue. That is what you're looking at with diphtheria. And if you ask me, it's much better to vaccinate against it so you never even get sick with it, rather than get sick with it, figure out maybe too late, and have to take your kid to the hospital for antibiotics. Meanwhile, tetanus is another bacteria that produces a really nasty toxin that pretty much locks your muscles into an on position, which means that you're having horrible back-breaking seizures if it goes untreated. These muscle contractions spread throughout your body until it reaches your diaphragm, where you eventually stop breathing. And if you've read accounts of people taking care of individuals dying from tetanus, it is horrible. It is an incredibly painful experience and a miserable death. All of these diseases would cause many deaths in the U.S. every year before vaccines were widespread. Now, thanks to vaccines, those numbers are close to zero. But in developing countries with poor health infrastructure, these diseases not only are still present, but are even deadlier because of that lack of health infrastructure. When people get sick, it might be harder to get access to the necessary antibiotics or supportive care that is required to give them the best chance of surviving. That's why prevention is the best medicine and why vaccines are so important, especially in developing countries, to help children survive. But Kennedy, in his decision to not help anymore with these efforts, cited some research around DTP vaccines that he claims shows that these vaccines increase the deaths of young girls. It's important to know that he has claimed that this is the case for many years. You can find interviews of him going way back and even videos of me debunking these same claims on this channel from several years ago. So this is not a new claim. This is not new evidence that he's bringing to the table. But what is this evidence? And is it strong? Does it stand up to scientific scrutiny? And if it doesn't stand up to scrutiny, then what does that say about his decision making? And what does it say about his ability and power to make decisions that affect children all over the world who most need this kind of help. There's going to be no suspense here. This research just does not show what RFK Jr. says it does. So let's look at why it doesn't support what he says it does and what the evidence actually says. In this decision, RFK Jr. references research pretty much only from one group, and that is a group led by a scientist named Dr. Peter Abbey. RFK Jr. calls Peter Abbey a deity of vaccine research, which 
I don't know where he's getting that. He's not considered a deity in vaccine research. That's not even really a thing in scientific research. Everybody gets judged on their evidence, no matter what they produced in the past or what their status is. It's like Lord of the Rings lore. There are people out there who are known to be like ultra experts in Lord of the Rings lore, like Stephen Colbert. But if he said something wrong about Lord of the Rings, you best believe fans are going to jump all over him and say, no, he got that one wrong. It's the same thing in science. If an expert says something that's wrong, their colleagues are going to call them out on it and make sure everybody knows that this person is wrong and their work is right. So let's look at the work that Peter Abbey has done and see if it stands up to scientific scrutiny. Basically, what his group has done is they've gone to places like Guinea-Bissau, and they've tracked health records of children over a set number of years. During this time, they're looking at whether or not the children have been vaccinated, specifically with DTP vaccines, and comparing their vaccination status to specific health outcomes, such as death. Here is a table showing the main findings of that work. This work was published in the journal eBiomedicine in 2017. The important number to look at here is the right-hand column called HR, which stands for hazard ratio. A hazard ratio is basically how often a particular event happens in one group compared to a reference group. In this case, the hazard ratio column is showing us the events of death in vaccinated groups compared to unvaccinated groups. Any number greater than one represents an increased risk of that event happening. But in parentheses here, we see what's called a confidence interval. What this confidence interval says is basically if you were to repeat the experiment 100 times, then 95 out of the 100 times, you would expect your results to fall within that range. So the important thing about confidence intervals is that they ideally should be as tight as possible. You should not have a huge range of confidence intervals if your data are statistically significant and very strong. But here in this table, we see very wide confidence intervals with the lower end going below one and the upper end going way above one. So basically, these data are not very strong or reproducible according to this data set. Now, that doesn't mean we immediately throw it away and say we can't conclude anything from this. It means that we just need better data. We need stronger evidence before making conclusions. So if we're going to be making decisions that put the fate of young children in the balance, then we better make sure that our evidence is strong. So let's look at the scientific literature and see if other people have done this work. A good rule of thumb is that if you're reading a scientific paper and you want to make sure that what you're reading is actually correct and reproducible, see if anyone else has researched it because more than likely they probably have. If the results are consistent across multiple groups working independently, then you can be more confident that your results are real. It turns out that there are many other studies looking at mortality as an outcome following DTP vaccination. A similar study to the one done in Guinea-Bissau by Dr. Peter Abbey's group was also done in India, and they found no evidence that DTP vaccines increase the risk of mortality in children. In fact, they found that when DTP, tuberculosis, and polio vaccines were all given to a child, they actually had a reduced risk of death. Another study was a randomized controlled trial of infants in Sweden. This study actually compared two different types of vaccines. Something I didn't mention earlier is that in other areas of the world, the DTP vaccine is what is given, but in the US and other developed countries, it's the DTAP vaccine that is given. The main difference between these two vaccines is that the DTAP includes toxins from the bacteria that the immune system mounts an immune response against. So when the bacteria infects you, your immune system neutralizes those toxins so that you don't ever get sick. Meanwhile, the DTP vaccines delivers toxins for diphtheria and tetanus, but includes whole killed bacteria for pertussis. And just to clarify, the toxins in all of these vaccines are deactivated so that they can't actually do the things they need to do in order to make you sick. The major differences between these two vaccines when it comes to safety and efficacy is that DTP vaccines, the ones given in developing countries, are slightly less safe than DTAP vaccines, but they're more effective, meaning that you don't have to give as many doses in order for someone to have a completed regimen. That means the DTAP vaccines that we get here in America and in other developed countries are less effective, so we need a few more doses to have a complete regimen, but they are slightly safer than the DTP vaccines. And when I mention this difference in safety, I mean that DTP vaccines are more likely to cause fevers and things like febrile seizures, which happens to infants when they have fevers. In the US and other developed countries, if there is a safer option for vaccines, then that is what is recommended. 
But because DTP vaccines require fewer doses and are also easier to distribute and store, they are what is given to countries that are less developed. And again, it's the DTP vaccines that Peter Abbey and RFK Jr. say are deadly to young children. But in this randomized control trial from Sweden, a direct comparison of the two found no difference in mortality outcomes. This information combined with other studies and looking at the literature as a whole consistently shows that DTP vaccines are not associated with an increased risk of death in children, and that this effect can only be shown in Peter Abbey's group in Guinea-Bissau. Epidemiologists who have weighed in on this have consistently said that bias in Peter Abbey's methods can explain the non-statistically significant results that they see in Guinea-Bissau. But you might be interested to know that this anomaly with Peter Abbey's group might go beyond just having a population that you can't pull statistically significant data from. Something that Peter Abbey's group and what RFK Jr. and a lot of anti-vaxxers consistently advocate for is a randomized controlled trial of this kind of thing, where you take DTP vaccines and compare it in a randomized controlled trial against unvaccinated children. Well, it turns out Peter Abbey actually did that study. So what did it say? Well, it turns out that the study was completed 14 years ago, and no paper has been published on the results. Now, that's interesting. Why would the results for the study that people demand not be published? Well, Dutch journalists, because Peter Abbey is Dutch, investigated, and they found out why. According to Peter Abbey, the study was affected by events like a graduate student getting pregnant and having to leave, and then that graduate student's research supervisor passing away. But the trial results were gathered. They just weren't published. And as far as the reporting by Dutch journalists can tell, it's because the results didn't agree with this notion that DTP vaccines increase the risk of deaths in children. That's right, so apparently their own study, which would be the gold standard randomized controlled trial of DTP vaccines, did not support their conclusions, or at least the conclusion they wanted to make. So it wasn't published. But that's not really surprising, because the work from the rest of the scientific community contradicts that notion. So this is RFK Jr.'s gold standard science. Papers with questionable statistics contradicted by several other groups from all over the world showing different results. He's basically pissing on public health and calling it gold standard. When you make a judgment on a scientific question, it is essential to look at all of the literature and all of the data gathered from all the research groups all over the world. It is essential to scrutinize the methods and tease out what is high quality and what is not high quality. And it is essential to take all of that into consideration and go where the evidence points you, no matter what your ideology or preconceived notions about the answer to that question might be. If RFK Jr. had said, hey, you know, I'm pro-vaccine and I don't think DTP vaccines are good enough for these kids in other countries. It's not safe enough for us, so why is it safe enough for them? I think they should have DTAP vaccines and then we'll give Gavi money. I mean, that also wouldn't have been perfect because these healthcare infrastructure systems would need a big upgrade if they were to successfully implement DTAP vaccines. So if he's willing to front the money for them to have better healthcare systems to, in order to do that, then, hey, that's great. But no, the guy who said he doesn't want to take away your vaccines is actively trying to take away vaccines from the people who most need them in the world. That is not gold standard science, that is not just asking questions, and that is not taking on big business in the public health space. That is monstrous science denial that should not be tolerated, especially in leaders of public health. And now I'm going to do something that I don't usually do on this channel. I'm going to do a fucking rant. Hold on, I'm going to get on a soapbox real quick. I don't have a soapbox, but I'm standing on a squatty potty. Oh man, my afro is out of frame. Hold on. Is this fine? I think it's fine. I'm now squatting on a squatty potty for my rant. Yeah, I know I'm goofing off a little bit, but I'm pissed and this sucks. So let me just explain why this is so wildly infuriating. In America, we're spoiled as hell when it comes to vaccine preventable diseases. We have a good enough healthcare infrastructure that almost everybody has access to vaccines and has access to them almost free because health insurance companies don't like it when people get really sick, have to go to the hospital, and they have to pay out all their medical bills. They would much rather prefer vaccines to be in place so that people don't get sick in the first place. Parents in America don't see their kids getting paralyzed by polio until they can't breathe. People in America don't see their kids suffering from back-breaking seizures from tetanus. People in America don't see their kids choking on dead tissue in their throat. But in underdeveloped countries where child mortality is more the norm than it is unusual, that's not the case. 
About 700,000 kids die every year from vaccine-preventable diseases, and 99% of those deaths are in countries where vaccine access is limited. Groups like Gavi depend on the goodwill and basic fucking decency of other countries to donate to their cause of getting children what they need so they don't die before age 5. There is no good reason why 700,000 kids every year can't live to see their first birthday. Oh, did I mention most of those 700,000 deaths are in children before they reach age 1? Because if I didn't, then most of those 700,000 deaths in children are before age 1 because of vaccine-preventable diseases. And RFK Jr., a guy who doesn't think that HIV caused the AIDS epidemic, a guy who lies constantly, a guy who was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, has the power to take away billions of dollars that go toward getting kids those vaccines because of an ideology that he has. It's not based on science. The guy cannot read a scientific paper to save his goddamn life. It's because he feels that he is right. He is making a decision that affects the lives of countless children because vibes. And it's not just the Gavi decision. Everything that RFK Jr. does follows the same pattern. From the claims he makes during his testimonies to the Senate to the most recent nonsense the Tylenol, RFK Jr. does not follow the evidence because he doesn't even understand the evidence to begin with. He brings ideology, not facts. And he is not man enough or honest enough to look at these ideas and actually challenge them. And that is what we should always be doing. We should always challenge our ideas. That's how we get better. That's how we move forward. That's how we improve and grow as a society. But him, he is stuck in this idea that he has had for decades that DTP vaccines cause deaths in children. When the exact opposite is true, all the information is there for him. He chooses to ignore it. He chooses to go with what has made him money over these years, what has brought him fame over these years, and he refuses to acknowledge the truth. But hey, I guess I shouldn't be surprised because at the end of the day, what I'm really asking for is for people to care and do something about kids who are simply born on the wrong side of the fence. Children who die from vaccine-preventable diseases committed no crime, did nothing wrong, and were simply born in a place where they could not be saved before they reach age one. But looking at history and the way things are going now, this is something that people just do not care about. We go on with our daily lives, ignoring the suffering and tragedies that are happening in the world. And I know, a lot of people genuinely can't do anything about them. But those who can do something about those events, choose not to. And people like RFK Jr. actively work against the goals of improving the lives of those people who are suffering the most. It's for this and many other reasons that RFK Jr. should resign. But he won't resign because he never admits he's wrong, and he will always continue to do this as long as he has support from his base, who are never going to stop supporting him. RFK Jr. needs to be fired, and the pressure for that to happen needs to come from the people who confirmed him as Secretary of HHS, especially Senator Bill Cassidy. This man knew what RFK Jr. was about. He knew about the HIV AIDS denialism. He knew about the anti-vaccine track record. He knew that the guy was a liar, but he still confirmed him anyway, because hey, that's how he keeps his political position, right? So yes, I'm pissed that people who don't know anything about science and have all the privilege in the world are making decisions that are going to hurt the least privileged people in the world the most. Oh god, my legs! Okay, I'm done ranting. The balls of my feet really hurt, and I think I feel a little bit better now until I open the internet later. Anyway, that is going to do it for this video. All of the links to all of the science that I talk about in this video are linked in the description below, so that you can be smarter than Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and, you know, read. I don't know when my next video is going to be, but hopefully I'll be able to put out content more consistently soon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.